and welcome to You Don't Play Boxing, Mirror Fighting's Influencer Boxing Podcast. I'm Martin Dom- Domin, even, joined by Donna Corby and Harry Davies. This week we're going to look back at Jake Paul's win over Nate Diaz. We're going to take a look ahead very briefly to Logan Paul's announcement of his fight with Dylan Dallas. And we're also going to step- check in with Donna, who is now, I believe, in Albuquerque, ahead of Bryce Hall's bare knuckle boxing debut. Obviously. But let's start with Jake Paul, Nate Diaz. Jake Paul taking the distance despite dropping Nate Diaz, ultimately winning a unanimous decision last weekend. Don, I'll come straight to you. You were there. Let's start with the event itself. It looked busy, it looked full. Uh, talk us through that and then we'll come to the specifics. Yeah, it was it was absolutely jointed in there, you know, and, and the the great trend with um with these like influencer shows is that people show up pretty early. So I got there, you know, uh, just for the first prelim and there was like a decent couple of hundred people, maybe a thousand people in there already. And then it packed all the way out to, I believe the capacity is 20,000. They had a gate of 3.1 million US, second biggest gate in the arena's history, the American Airlines Center uh, for a fight after the first UFC back from COVID, which was uh, obviously a pretty big deal. So yeah, it was an unbelievable atmosphere. Nate is still a monster draw. He had so many fans. I, you know, if in the arena it felt like it was a closer fight than it was because of how loud the crowd were. But really, there were a lot of times where I'd turn to the people sitting next to me and I'd be like, "That didn't go like how the crowd think it went." Like Jake would win an exchange, and everyone would go, "Oh!" Like Nate had done something. And um, yeah, I don't think uh, it, it quite went like that. But you know. Another good performance from Jake. I think the MMA angle is over, and now he's got to just wait and see what happens in Manchester October 14th. Yeah, I mean, I hope you're right. I hope you're right. Harry, the fight itself, did it? We talked about it last week, and and we we did decide that Jake Paul would win on points, so hopefully, you know, letters, money, anything that people want to send us uh, after after that prediction, are coming in soon. But did the fight play out largely as you expected? Yeah, I think when I was I was talking about and giving my prediction on last week's episode, I sort of said we would see some of the the antics from Nate, such as like him putting Jake in a chokehold and sort of walking away, showboating and saying like, this guy's doing nothing to me. And I think we, we sort of backed him to do, you know, not too well in the early rounds, but come on strong later on. And I think that's sort of how the fight went, right? You know, he was kind of found like a second wind and he looked like he started to care almost as the fight went went, went later on but um yeah a, a good win for Jake I, I sort of did see it playing this way I thought maybe he could have got the stoppage and it looked like in that fifth round when he dropped him that he was going to go for the kill and, and go for it but as he said after the fight he didn't want to gas himself out because that's what a lot of people have made the mistake of doing against Nate so it was a solid win for Jake and uh, I know a lot of people were saying oh we couldn't even finish a, a washed MMA fire but at the end of the day, he got the win, and I think after losing to Tommy, that's all that matters. It was, it looked actually very early on, Donna, as if it would be, well, as one side, as it largely was, but it looked very early, as if it could be over very quickly. Uh, Jake started fast, and, and Nate didn't. What were your thoughts as the fight got underway? Yeah, no, you're right. It started quickly. Jake was, was looking for the finish early. Um, started fast. Nate, like you say, didn't start fast, then pretty much I mean, is it fair to say he didn't really start at all? Like he didn't like, he never came out of second gear really. And, and he, you know, he never pushed through a little bit and, and kind of showed like they talk about this cardio. It's like, yeah, but he wasn't exactly, you know, middling in punches. And I remember at one point him catching Jake with a, a two or three punch combination later in the fight. And I remember turning to the, the reporter next to me and being like, this guy is not a power puncher. Like, it, and Jake has pretty much said as much that, you know, I think Jake has said like he could have stood there and had his chin out like one of those punching machines and said, line one up and and smack me with one. And he thinks that Nate probably wouldn't have put him down even then. So it was, um, yeah, look, it it was largely how we expected it to go. Nate's very tough, but he went down. The streak of Jake Paul knockdowns continues. He's beaten. He's he's put down every opponent he's fought, even the the one he lost to Tommy Fury. So, you know, I I think Jake would probably give himself like a – I, I would imagine like a C or B, like a B minus, C plus, something like that. Like it wasn't his best showing, but it would be very tough to give your best showing against someone like Nate Diaz. He's just a tough, tough guy. Harry, Donna mentioned G, uh, sorry, Nate Diaz's power or lack of it. He did have a few moments 
in the fight. I don't know how much of that was down to Jake, sort of, as Don alluded to earlier, sort of stepping off a little bit just to, or you did, sorry, to preserve his gas tank. But Nate never really looked like making any indent at all, did he? He just, you know, he might have landed a few punches, but I'd have backed you to take them, probably. Yeah, it's the weird thing is with when, when Nate sort of has a good moment in the fight, we saw it like in Leon Evers' fight, he doesn't really follow up. It's never like, oh, I've got this guy where I want him, I'll, I'll go even further now. He sort of just almost takes it as a moral victory for that brief exchange. And then, you know, might point at Jake or like do some sort of like, I know there's a lot of times where Jake would punch him and he would just sort of pretend it hurt and it didn't. And it's sort of some weird things. That a lot of people say Nate's in these fights where he loses and he somehow comes out with some sort of win in the fight, like the whole choke at the end. So it's really bizarre. I don't know if it's maybe because he's at this stage in his career where, you know, if he beats Jake Paul, then what? Does he's not going to go on and, and push for a world title like Jake wants to, is he? So maybe he sees sees it in these ways. If I can get a little edge over Jake in the actual fight, then it's a win in, a win in his mind. So, but no, he never really had Jake hurt or troubled. I know there were some brief good spells, like you mentioned, but I feel like in Nate's mind, he'll just be you know glad that he had a, a somewhat decent show in. And as he said, he in a real fight, Jake wouldn't stand a chance, uh, according to him. So I think that's all that matters for Nate. Do you think, Donna, that Nate Diaz tried in training? Do you think he made much of an effort at all before this fight? Well, he was injured, wasn't he? That's what they said afterwards. Oh, he had an injury. It's every fight with Nate. Oh, he had an injury. Oh, well, you know, if it weren't for this, if he didn't get caught against Masvidal, he would have beat him. And he pretty much beat Leon Edwards, but he didn't put his foot on the gas. You know, Nate, for someone who's so famously tough, um, which he is, he is like a... He's he's a, a rugged fighter. He's he's dogged, but he's like he also he's no stranger to the old excuses either after the fight. And so I guess his excuse uh, there was that he had some some sort of an injury in uh, in the camp, and that would explain why he couldn't beat Jake Paul. Okay. Uh, what do you think this does, Harry? For I'm both to use the word legacy because Jake Paul's fought a few. MMA fighters and Tommy Fury, so let's not get too carried away. But what does it do for his standing in the boxing world? Is his reputation, shall we say, enhanced after this fight, or is it exactly what it was, at the, you know, before he fought Nate Diaz? Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's it's changed a, t- a little bit. A, a win over someone like Nate is, is good for anyone, right? Any, regardless of an influencer or a traditional boxer, it's a it's a good thing to have under your belt but as all the people around him were saying before this fight oh if he can't beat Nate Diaz then you know, he should retire he has no nowhere to be in the sport so it's like we said on, on last week's episode I feel like it was a risky fight for Jake to take because he doesn't really gain much from it right yeah he he beat Nate but everyone will still make the point of the first proper boxer he fought in Tommy he lost to so they will just see it as a similar win as his win against Tara Woodley or his win against Anson Silva it's a, a win against another UFC fighter who is not a boxer and is at the end of their career. So in that sense, it really doesn't push him much up in in where he is in the sort of influence or crossover boxing world. But I feel like for him, it will do more because in his mind, right, he's, he's now on a win. So whatever fight he goes into next, he's not looking to avenge the loss of, of Tommy Fury and get back to win away. So I feel like it's not done much for his, his reputation, but in his mind, it will give him a lot of confidence going into whoever he fights next. Also, just on, on that point, it, it's hysterical how a lot of these influencers have come out of the woodwork now and gone, oh, well, I think I'd beat Jake. Like, for example, I saw Ashley from Raksu, who, who beat King Kenny, go, oh, I think comfortably I'd beat Jake. And I thought, you got put down in three seconds by Anthony Taylor, who's a considerably worse MMA fighter than Nate Diaz, known for not having – much smaller, doesn't have the power Nate would have. Like, people forget that any other exa- – people like – Love this thing of like, oh, well, Jake beat an MMA fighter. But any other example of a YouTuber fighting an MMA fighter has not gone particularly well for the YouTuber. Dr. Mike got smashed up by Chris Avila. Ashley Debbie has been, has been smashed up by Anthony Taylor. Salt Pappy, who's supposedly the next best guy after KSI and Jake. He had a lot of things exposed by Anthony Taylor, who it would admit himself, way lower level MMA fighter than Nate. So I think people need to put a little bit of respect. I think... A lot of these names on Jake's resume, people would be surprised. Like, it, it would people would be surprised how Ben Askren would make certain people look if you know he if he got in there with some of these other YouTubers. So I think it's uh I think that Jake needs to have a little bit more respect put on his name. I know people will slag me off on social media and say that you know I'm 
uh, riding for Jake or whatever. But I do think uh, I do think it's not as easy as it looks to beat a career fighter like a Tyron Woodley and Nate Diaz, a, a Ben Askren and Anderson Silva. It's it's actually quite difficult, and a lot of these other YouTubers have failed at it. I think going on what Donna was saying there as well was. I maybe feel like after Jake's second fight with Tyron Woodley, you know, he flatlines a former UFC champion, that people put him in a different bracket and have said, well, you can't cl classify him in the Dr. Mike's and, you know, the other sort of crossover influences with boxers of the world because that sort of proved that, you know, he's maybe in a league of his own. So they sort of expect him to, to, to wipe the floor with Nate Diaz and almost forget that Jake's only been doing this for what he says, like, you know, five years maybe. So... So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a weird one with Jake. Maybe he doesn't get the credit he deserves because he is sort of in his own league, really, other than maybe KSI might have a, a different opinion on that. But I feel like, like Donna's saying, maybe should, people should give him a bit more praise than he got for being Nate. I think part of the problem as well is that until, hopefully, anyway, KSI fights Tommy Fury, there's very little, you know, there's very little to use to compare the two directly. You know, had KSI fought Tyron Woodley when that was, that was talked about last year, I think, that would have given us some sort of barometer. But right now, KSI's fought, you know, let's be honest, nobody. Uh, and so it's very hard to say, well, KSI can come out and say, I'd have done this, that, and the next thing against Nate Diaz. But until he actually fights someone who Jake has fought, which we will see in October, then it's very, very difficult. But would, after having, after seeing Jake fight Nate Diaz, were he to fight Tommy Puri in October, November, whatever, instead... Would you think, would you be more confident now of him winning that rematch than you were a week ago? Well, I, I don't know necessarily about, you know, more like more or less confident. I mean, it was, it wasn't as close of a fight as maybe they made out. I think that judge that gave the fight to Jake the first time was probably the only person in the world that gave the fight to Jake. It was a, it was a fairly clear Tommy victory, even with the knockdown and everything. So I guess it would be similarly close. You wonder. You know, Tommy's after making a, a monster paycheck now. He's a father. He's got his, his other responsibilities. And uh, you wonder, like, how intensively he's been working behind the scenes. You know, he, he was in Soccer Aid. I don't think he exactly set the world alight there. Um, and then he, uh, you know, he's he's, um, he's 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 one of these guys as well who kind of, like, like he's a, a fury in the sense of, like, he kind of balloons a little bit between the fights. He always looks great, but he's still, you know, He's, he's not exactly in fighting shape year round. And um, I think you would wonder how it, how it would go. I mean, I, I, I still imagine that Tommy will beat KSI and that'll kind of set up the rematch. But, you know, I, it, it was relatively close the last time. And I don't think that Jake's got any worse. You know, another another camp with these Kronk guys and, and working in Puerto Rico with his team, perhaps he could he could get the result, I think. It'll be interesting to see what what that'll be like now next year when they do end up doing the rematch if the, if that happens. Um, but I, I I reckon there's Jake would always have a shot in in that fight. It would be not a big shot, but he definitely has I think more of a shot than KSI does. After after the fight with Nate, we had another reiteration of an offer from Jake Paul to Nate Diaz to do the rematch in the cage. Ten million dollars is supposedly the price. Nate seemed a little bit more open to that this time how do you think we ever see that uh that's a good question i don't think so i feel like nate you had said and if you actually watch the post fight press conference even when he was sort of talking about the fight the 10 million offer thing you can see his uh his, his right hand man zach rosenfield sort of whisper and say that's going to take a lot more than 10 million dollars so maybe they would do the mma fight but it'd take more money to to get Nate in the cage, especially for, for someone who's not like the UFC. I know he wants to go back there. Obviously, Jake's with the PFL, and I know sort of Nate played down any any PFL fight for him on that half. So I don't think it will happen, I feel like. Obviously, I think early odds makers sort of opened with Nate as a huge favourite, and understandably so, right? He said that in that last round when he put Jake in a guillotine, you know, it could have been over there. So I don't think it would be wise to do it, and I, I think going what what Jake was saying, I, thought, I know he said he wanted to do an MA fight, but... He also said he wants to become a world champion. I don't think it makes sense for him to go. I know he's obviously with the PFL and PFL wants to make his pay-per-view debut there. But I feel like it just doesn't really make much sense, that fight. Jake's already got a win over him. And if he goes and loses to Nate in MMA, then what do we do? A trilogy in a, a different discipline? It just seems a bit weird. I feel like maybe Jake should just, for now, stick with the, with, with the rematch of Tommy Fury and hopefully 
the KSI fight, but I, I don't really want to see that in MMA. I don't think it's, it serves any purpose. I don't suppose you disagree, Donna. Yeah, I mean, look, he, he's. I, I want to see him do an MMA fight. You know, he, he appears like PFL are, are talking about him as if he's um, a signed fighter. I know that Amanda Serrano, his close friend and one of the best women's boxers in the world, has signed on with them as well. So he, he's going to fight next year in the PFL, from what I understand. Whether it's against Nate Diaz, we'll see. Nate will probably need a lot more, like we say, than $10 million um, dollars to do that. Uh, so we'll, we'll have to see. But I, I think a better bet for him in MMA would be you know, someone uh, from a striking background, someone, you know, not a black belt in jiu-jitsu maybe, or if they are a black belt, then with a, a very limited striking background. I don't think the Nate Diaz fight is going to happen, even if PFL, you know, the number two promotion in the world in MMA are, are going to make that offer. I think uh, I, I think they're, they're going to need a lot more than $10 million and a lot more than what they have at the moment to uh, to get Nate Diaz into the cage. And he seems to want he seems to want to do his MMA fighting in the UFC anyway. He seems to, that seems to be, you know, what he's making clear. So I think... Uh, I think unlikely that we see it in the smart cage. Going on what Donna was saying as well as, you know, you look at Clarissa Shields, two tight, two weight undisputed champion, and she gone into MMA and, and fought, I think it was Brittany Elkin. And uh, again, not many people have a clue who Brittany Elkin is. And I believe Clarissa was actually sort of, it was 1 1 going in the third round, and Clarissa got the stoppage. And then in her next fight, she loses to Abby Montez. And these are, are, are sort of known names in MMA, right? And for, for Jake to go in there and, and fight someone like Nate, who's fought in some of the biggest fights in UFC history. And like Donna says there with his graph and accolades, it would sort of be suicide in that sense because there's no way that Jake is even with a couple months, six months training, even a year training, is getting any sort of, of, of way to to beat Nate on the ground. And, and that's where I feel like it would be just a huge mismatch and, and a mistake for Jake to go in there against Nate for his first fight in MMA. It just doesn't really make any sense. So following on from that, in two words, who does Jake fight next and when? That'd be more than two words, probably, but you know, you know what I mean. Um, I think he's going to be in Manchester October fourteenth. He told me last week, so he'll be there ringside for his brother's fight. Um, I would imagine he will probably wait out the winner of KSI and Tommy Fury. Um, you know, he, he's. I I would imagine if if there's not another fight like imminently available to him in the near future, I think he'll probably put a lot of his attention on to promoting the Shadeja Green and Savannah Marshall fight like he did with Serrano and Taylor and kind of used that as an opportunity to stay in the spotlight, stay on Sky Sports, stay in the boxing world, but help to push something else. And, and you mentioned the word legacy earlier, and I'd imagine if Jake does have a legacy in boxing, this will be part of it, is this huge push he's made for first Amanda, now Shadeja, uh, Ashton Silva as well. So, so I think he'll, he'll probably take some time off, focus on that, and then wait out what happens in Manchester o- October 14th at the the prime card in and and see and and look maybe it'll, it'll maybe it'll be the winner of KSI versus Tommy or maybe Dylan Danis will go in and, and smoke his brother we'll see um but and and you know in in combat sports things change very quickly if Dylan knocks out Logan or if he even shows up at all then maybe he could uh maybe he could write his name into into the the conversation for that fight that does take us on to Logan Paul against Dylan Dennis, announced officially this week on October 14th, the prime card, KSI, Tommy Fury. In one word, Harry, does Dylan Dennis turn up? Does Dylan Dennis turn up? Um, maybe to the press conference this time. I know he didn't make it to the press conference when I, I think I went to that in January and everyone was saying, oh, he's going to be there, but he'll be on Zoom. And he was he wasn't even in our Zoom. He was even in there on Zoom, so who knows? I um I don't think he will turn up on fight night. Uh, I feel like he might be there for fight week, and, and for whatever reason, it will fall apart. So, so I don't think we get that fight as much as it would be great. And I want to see Dylan. I don't think we will. So cynical for someone so young, don't I? <laughs> no, I I, I think uh, Harry may be right. I see he had a little guest appearance there from uh, Eamon Camp from Seconds Out in the background, and that's probably why he's decided to to go on mute there. But I think he's right. Dylan has shown no indication yet that he's going to show up to these things. He has pulled out of Bellator fights. He's pulled out of the KSI fight. I think that the, I think the Logan was saying on Impulsive that there is a fine in place where if he pulls out, Logan has to bring an independent doctor in who his team have chosen, not independent, I guess a doctor on Team Paul, 
And if they diagnose that the injury is not bad enough that he can pull out, then he will be fined 100,000 US dollars. So I guess that that uh, gives him some help there. I know that Connor has been pushing the fight. He's, he's posted three or four times about it. So maybe Dylan will make an appearance, but uh, the evidence as of right now is not good. Presumably there is a, st- a backup opponent, or there will be. I mean, it would be completely daft not to. So at least, at least we should see Logan Paul in the ring, right? I would imagine so, but Misfits' backup opponents have been a little lackluster. You know, I I know that uh, Swarms face Temper, um, a couple of Louis Pineda. Uh, the, the backup opponents tend to uh, tend to be a little under the, you know, they, they tend to not be the the star names. So I know that people are talking about, oh, maybe Woodley will step in and maybe this will happen. I think it's more likely that it'll be someone uh, the 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 general public have not heard of. If, if it is. Um, a, a step in opponent, but yeah, I think they desperately need to have someone locked in. I don't know why they're going back into the Dylan Dennis business, but it appears uh, it appears they're interested in it for some reason. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure he's I'm sure he said all the right things to, to get to this point to get to an announcement, but as you say, it does feel like a risk. But I suppose if if you've got four big names on that card and three of them turn up, then you know, not quite what Meatloaf signed, but you know, the card would still go ahead. Would still be a success, but hopefully, I think it's fair to say if Dylan Dennis does turn up in the week, that makes things a lot more interesting. His entourage, etc., etc., not just not just what happens on fight night. That is October, a couple of months away. I'm sure, it will be here before we know it. Don has disappeared, but he is very much taking centre stage for this final section. I hope Bryce Hall, YouTuber, taking a different route than. Most of his compatriots or his contemporaries. This Friday in Albuquerque, which is why Donna is there, he is fighting on bare knuckle card. Donna, are you indeed? Oh, he's back just in time. And you know what? Donna's I heard off. everything you were saying as well. Uh, lots of good stuff. Uh, no, I, the housekeeping here in uh, in Albuquerque would not stop knocking on my door, so I had to go up and tell him, you know, I'm okay. But yes, yeah, Bryce Hall, bare knuckle. What about it? <laughs> well, Donald, that's exactly what you're going to tell us. Why is he doing it? What's going to happen? And yeah, it does seem to be he's, he almost wants to, I mean, it's a bold move, but he does seem to want to sort of carve his own little niche. Yeah, I mean, what he has basically said is is that it's an opportunity to kind of catapult himself back into the the top of the YouTuber scene by doing something so outlandish that, that nobody else seems interested in doing. You know, it, it's it's an interesting endeavor for Bryce to be undertaking. He's fighting somebody coming up 40 pounds in weight, G Perez. And I asked him, I was like, is it is the reason you're fighting a bare knuckle guy because there's not an influencer on the planet who would take it? And he said, yeah, pretty much. So I think bare knuckle is so hardcore. It's so intense. It's such a, a gnarly sport. And, and I was saying to him, I was like, you're not like the winners come out pretty gruesome from these fights too. It's not just like, you're going to go out there and blast this guy out and he goes, no, I don't think I'm going to get cut. Maybe I'll get one or two. And then he shows me his hands and they're all blistered up and everything from hitting the bag, bare knuckle. I mean, he hasn't even sparred without gloves yet. Um, I'd imagine it's not recommended, right? I know that if you're fight, like, let's say you're fighting in 10 ounce for the first time, maybe you could do a round or two just to, to get the feel of it, but you wouldn't spar a whole 10 ounce glove fight. And, and I think that he's, but he's not even, you know, punched another person bare knuckle yet, which is, is interesting because G Perez is something of a veteran at it. So it's, it, it's a, a, an interesting endeavor for Bryce, but I think he'll probably, um, I think, I think if he wins, it certainly will launch him into the discussions and maybe he gets himself a big fight with Deji that he's looking for. Going on what Donna was saying about bare knuckle is I think this is so out there because a lot of, you know, former UFC fighters, when they go to bare knuckle, they're even surprised at how different it is, just that, you know, that the bone on bone sort of thing. It, it takes them by surprise, even with four ounce gloves, there's not much pad in there, but they go into the bare knuckle thing, and it's a whole different ball game. And and the fact that Bryce is going in there with someone who's used to it, it's gonna go could go in his favor, but it could also go horribly wrong, especially like Donna said there, when with the back of his mind, he's maybe got the notion that he might get one or two cuts. It could be a lot worse than he thinks. So um you know, fair, fair play to him for doing it, but I feel like there's a reason why not many influencers have stepped into the BKFC ring before, and maybe this could prove that. 
I guess if you are going to fight bare knuckle, you probably don't want to think too much about what's going to happen, right? And maybe you just, I think all boxers, all fighters lie to themselves and tell, you know, about injuries, etc., etc. But certainly bare knuckle, you probably just need to tell yourself, you know, it's going to be absolutely fine, don't worry about it. Yeah, and I guess he's he's banking on the guy being so much lighter. Like Bryce has, has, is shredding down to 165. I think he was telling me that at his heaviest, like he's not like a, you know, a guy who really gets fat or anything, but he's he, he's he's in he's always in good nick. But he, he has talked about in the past using steroids and and you know he works out a lot for his muscles and everything like that. So he's he was telling me he's been as high as 195. He's getting himself down to 165 for this fight. And then G Perez, I think his last fight was 125. So you're looking at putting on three stone, which is uh, is pretty sizable, just under three stone. So it, it'll be. Interesting to see how that whole dichotomy plays out. And I guess that's what he was going for. I think he said to me explicitly as well, I wasn't going to fight someone my size in this sport. I wasn't going to fight someone who, you know, has experience and um, is going to batter me. I, I said I'll fight someone if I get considerable physical advantages over them. He's pretty open and honest about the whole thing. And I don't think this is a long-term plan for him. I think he's maybe going to get involved on the business side. He's very involved with Triller, Ryan Kavanaugh, who's, you know, a, a, a big name in in the bare knuckle scene and, and he's he's obviously bought the company out and I think he has a good relationship with David Feldman, but don't expect to see too many more YouTubers taking off the gloves altogether. No, let's we'll obviously talk about that next week next week and, and, and reflect on it. Any other news, anything else you, you wish to discuss in the world of influencer boxing? Anything you've heard this week, Donna, that uh, we need to talk tell people about? Well, there's there's a lot of uh, drama about this prime card. Of course, we've got our main event and our co-headliner, Logan versus uh, Dylan, and then our main event, KSI versus Tommy. But it remains to be seen what will happen for the returning Saul Pappy. He was supposed to fight Slim Albert on this card. Uh, and now it, it's emerging in this scene, much like in regular boxing, the purse was not enough, is, is the report. It's all played out very publicly. Promoter Mams Taylor has been, you know, putting it all out there that Slim's ducked the fight and he doesn't fancy it. Slim's come back and said, not exactly. He's, you know, basically said, you guys, in a roundabout way, he said it very weirdly and spelled it all wrong and everything, but basically said, you guys know what I want. Um, so this undercard already getting a bit of drama. I know there's other fights being worked on. They're looking to get Anthony Taylor and Le'Veon Bell in there, which would be big for the American audience. Um, in terms of the rest of the undercard, though, there's going to be a lot of, they're calling it the Super Bowl of influencer boxing. Uh, all the all the big stars are going to be involved. So uh, Super Saul Papi will fight somebody. I just don't know if it'll be Slim Albert, unfortunately. Um, there's there's interest. They want him to fight Blueface, who uh, who beat Ed Matthews. They want him to fight um, Ashley, Ashley from Raksu, who beat King Kenny. There are names out there that are available. Um, but yeah, the, the big drama this week online, aside from the, the Jake and Logan feud, which everyone saw, on impulsive last night, which is an interesting topic if we have a minute or two, but the, the big topic online this week has been salt Pappy versus slim not happening over apparently a purse dispute, which is becoming more of a, a trend in this scene. So what you're saying that while well, everything in boxing has changed, nothing in boxing has really changed. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And here we thought this was a bright new dawn. Uh, Jake and Logan Paul, I'll be honest, I haven't been catching up with that. So, Talk to me what's going on there. Well, you know, you've got a life, unlike myself. Uh, so I, I think that probably is why you haven't caught up on all the impulsive drama between Jake and Logan. But there's a there was dispute over basically Misfits has been on, on their shows since Jake and Nate was announced. They were pretty uh, deep into like they advertised the, the Nate pay-per-view. They put it on their schedule and everything. And then it, people will have noticed watching the broadcast on Saturday night, no mention of... KSI versus Tommy or or Logan versus it was it was basically KSI and Logan fighting on the same car, card KSI versus Tommy Logan opponent TBA at the time and Logan was upset about this he was upset that he traveled all the way across America on a private jet to get there from SummerSlam and then they told him basically could you leave the prime at home for one night and he did not like that at all there's footage of him on the side of the ring kind of sulking about and you know Logan I think I think maybe he'd admit it himself. He, if there's an opportunity to take the spotlight from his brother, he he maybe will take it a lot of the time. Um, and you know he's he was upset that uh, that the card wasn't promoted. So Jake and Logan are going back and forth. Jake saying he plays 
both sides because you know there's and and <laughs> Jake's point makes a bit of sense because Logan has teamed up with two of Jake's biggest rivals, KSI and Dana White. You know now that like Prime are our main sponsor on the UFC. You see it everywhere. Like Harry, you go to these events, you're, all you can see is these Prime sponsorships everywhere. And you know it is. I, I think that's maybe the more egregious one than the KSI thing because a boxing feud is a boxing feud at the end of the day. Like they can fight and it'll all be over. Theoretically, that could be done within a few months. But Jake's taken a pretty hard line stance on like a labor relations issue when it comes to Dana and the UFC, which is a bit more serious than, you know, oh, I want to fight you or I'm a better boxer than you. And Logan has basically said, yeah, no, I'm actually going to pump millions of dollars into that company that you have the dispute with. Um, and and you know he's and and he seems to not understand what the the issue could be there. So uh, I think this sort of rivalry could or th- this kind of under underlying tension could end up boiling over a little bit more because they were not holding back on the on the podcast last night. Basically, what me and Donna were saying last night is all signs point towards Paul versus Paul twenty twenty four, and all three of us will be on for a very busy week. <laughs> I think we'd probably all just retire the next day as well. <laughs> we, we, we complete boxing, YouTube boxing journalism, if that ever happened. I certainly want to pay rise, that's for sure. And God forbid oh. we ever do some real boxing journalism, that would be terrible. <laughs> well, if, uh, if certain, certain boxers weren't failing drugs tests, then we'd have a much bigger <laughs> fight this weekend. But that's for a different podcast. Anyway, that is all for this week. We'll be back next week to look back at Bryce Hall, as I said. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And until next time, do take care.